Hi, I'm Courtney Act. Welcome to One Plus One. Today's guest is one of the most recognisable faces on Australian television, veteran entertainer Jay Lagaya. As Jay approaches 40 years treading the boards, I sat down with him to discuss being a trailblazer, his love of theatre and children's entertainment, and what it's like juggling fame and fatherhood. Let's look through the square window. Do you like to dance? There's a book. Let's find out what happens. Jay Lagaya, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you very much. It's so lovely to see you. I've, I've seen you for so many years on Australian television and on Australian stages and around the world, in fact. I just want to rattle off a list of a few things that you've been on. Play School, Water Rats, Star Wars, Lion King, Wicked, Home and Away, just to name a few. What is the thing that you're most recognised for? Probably Play School. Yeah. I mean, I did Play School for 16 years. Um, uh, Early education and early learning is one of my passions, but uh, it allowed me just to go and have a play, which is, I think, one of the great lessons that it taught me and one of the great lessons that has stayed with me for my entire career. This is the Play School River. Let's see if the ferry can float. Ready to launch the ferry on the Play School River. <laughs> Hooray! Hooray! It floats. Now to see if the fairy can go across. Play School's one of those shows that is so ubiquitous in Australian culture, especially, you know, in your era. Every kid grew up watching Play School. Like, you're a part of every Australian's life of a certain generation. How important is that? I thought it was a kid's show to start off with until I was doing a, a concert, a Play School concert um, out in Brisbane. And a young Pakistani boy, he's probably about 22, came to me and said, you taught me to speak English. And I looked at him and thought, I've got a large family, but uh, <laughs> I would have recognised you there. And he said, no, we come from Pakistan as, as refugees. Uh, and I was four years old. And so to learn the language, my parents told us to watch play school. And so we watched play school and we learned songs uh, and, uh, and we learned to sing the songs and also then, you know, mouth the words and in doing so, we learned to speak English. And not only that, our parents learned to speak because they used to sing Twinkle Twinkle and, you know, uh, and all of the rainbow songs with us as well. So for me, it, it really did drive it home that, that we are the hang that rocks the cradle, that early education, especially on television, you know, for kids especially, if they can see it, they can dream it, you know. And, and I think that that's, uh, that's what sort of play school is for a lot of not only my generation, but, you know, it's been on for nearly 70 years. Mm. It's that, the second longest running children's show in the world? That's right, next yeah. to uh, Blue Peter, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, but it's comfort food. Mm. You know, parents know that they can put their child in front of this show for half an hour mm. and leave knowing full well that they'll get a cup of tea or they'll get something mm. done and their child will get educated and entertained. Is it ready? Yes, Deborah's profile. Do I look like that? <laughs> It's fun. You know, from working on Play School, I was able to develop my own television show, Jay's Jungle, which ran for five seasons. You know, I ended up writing books and albums uh, and I got to meet a, a bunch of people around the country whose children have grown up and now who are, are great friends who, who come to support me in, in my grown-up, you know, theatre productions or, or television productions. And so it's a gift that just keeps giving, you know. So I suppose for me it's it, it's, it's a no-brainer. When my audition came around, they said, just sing a song and, uh, and tell a story. So I sang a song and I told a story like I do every night with my kids. And, uh, and they came back and said, we would love you to be part of... And I still didn't know what I was really a part of until the first rehearsal came around and my co-presenter was Deborah Malin. And I sort of looked at her and went, don't stand too close to me because we'll look like a gang, OK? And she laughed and she just carried me through the first two shows and I was hooked from then. 
has being a dad made you a better play school host or has being a play school host made you a better dad? Oh, no, being a dad obviously made me a better play school host. I think it is, uh, you know, it, it, it's one of those things that you know who you're talking to because we don't have children in the studio. And, uh, uh, and I, think, I suppose for me, one of the, one of the biggest things that, that I've always wanted to bring up as far as the whole play school thing is, is that the experience is just wonderful. Uh, but we are, I suppose, like, the presenters are like the toys in your toy box as you grow up because at a certain time you get discarded. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't realise is that, uh, you know, you work for 16 years or for however long on a show like Play School, then all of a sudden you don't get called anymore and you wonder why and you ring up and they go, oh, you know, we're, we've got this or we've got that happening. But then a week becomes, two weeks becomes, and you never actually get an official um, thank you, we're, we're, we're going a new path. Or, and that's something I suppose as an ex-presenter and a lot of the, our presenters have come across is that one of those things that you sort of want to address with them as well is go, look, you know, we not only with the toys, you know, we're part and parcel of people's lives, um, but as a professional, that's the, sh the business part of show business. There's a lot of subtle messages in play school and you said uh, you've got to see it to be able to dream it. You'll find it's really interesting that children's television is the most diverse television that we have on screen. When you grow up, we seem to go missing. <laughs> you say, and, and that's a commentary on not only society, because you always base a society. When I travel overseas, I watch their television because it will reflect, you know, who they hold, you know, most dearest and who they, you know, the stories that they reflect. And I think on Play School, but it reflects the community which I think is something that grown-up television can learn from. I recently got asked to do a Play School Storytime segment, which I was obviously excited about. Yeah. But then I heard the voices of other people creep in and say, oh, is that appropriate, a drag queen doing Play School Storytime? And then I, I sort of had that moment in my head and I was like, oh, gosh, if I'm thinking this, like I've done all this, you know, work to unpack shame and identity and everything, what are other people thinking? And, and almost that's why I should be on Play School Story Time. In Play School, we'd say that's a grown up idea. Yeah. You know, because I've never had a three year old look my CV up. They just want you to tell them the story. And in this box, just you look beautiful and you're going to tell me a story and I'll sit and watch. And I think the thing is, is that that's what outside people tend to forget that we're not trying to indoctrinate kids, we're just trying to say, I'm a person in your neighbourhood and I'm going to tell you a story. And, and I think that's the great thing about play school. And that's the great thing about children's television, especially Australian children's television, is that we hear our voices. We hear your voices telling stories that is relevant to us and we can then regurgitate that at home, you know. And I think that's the lovely thing about just storytelling and also being part of that and being part of being on television. For me, it's always that thing of going, if they can see it, then they can go, you're giving me permission. I mean, my son's doing Hamilton at the moment. That cast is not, they, they not only are such professionals and such a great show, but also the amount of ethnic people that go along going, I can see me. Mm. And if I can see me up there, then you've given me permission to get up there as well. When you said, uh, we're not trying to indoctrinate, we're just showing you this is a person who lives in a neighbourhood. I had just like a little, I, had, I think that was, the bow for me on that self-doubt of play school story time where I was like, oh, that's it. I'm just a person in your neighbourhood and I'm going to tell you a story. That was actually quite a, like a nice little aha moment in my mind. So thank you. No, well, look, I, I, at the end of the day, you're somebody's auntie who's telling me a story. Yeah. Grown-ups will sit there and they will add their own yes, narrative I might to have that. Better hair. Yes, that's right. <laughs> exactly. It goes, oh my gosh, look at those cheekbones. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they want to know where Goldilocks went to. They want to know what happened to the three little pigs. You know, and I think that's that's the fundamental underlining of, of either telling stories, you know, and what we do, you know, in theatre. Mm. Jay, you're constantly described uh, as one of Australia's most beloved entertainers. How does that make you feel? I don't know what that means, really, beloved entertainers. <laughs> means we love you. We yes. love watching you on television it is one and of in the things, yeah. uh, I, I, Look, it is... I, I, it was said to me once that, you know, that when your name is mentioned, people smile. Mm. 
which is, I think, for me, is a blessing, you know, and, and I suppose a reflection on, on my upbringing, my parents. It's um, something that I, I take on with great pride, um, but you're still going forward. You know, it's that thing of going, I can be beloved, but can I be working at the same time? <laughs> well, I think you're living proof that you can be both. Yeah. And have you had to work hard for that reputation? I did work hard for it. I, I realised that if I need to make that meeting or if I need to make that audition, I can't moan about it. I've got to run, you know. And if you're two seconds late or a minute late but you're there, you know, you're more likely for them to allow you in than for you to sit at a bus stop going, I can't make it so I'm not going to do it. And I did that for the first probably 15 years of my life and then realised, like most actors, now I've got to be able to put a quality over quantity. I've got to look at the narrative that I'm trying to create and especially the, the path that I want to be able to create and go from that. You know, and, and I always say that success is a bus that runs on the road, you know, of opportunity and we sit on the couch of what ifs. You've got to get off that couch and get run over by that bus. And sometimes that means that you have to leave the comfort of where you are, Auckland, New Zealand, and come to a bigger pond and try your luck, you know, because I think the last thing I would ever want to do is, you know, as I'm growing old gracefully, is to go, I coulda, shoulda, woulda, you know. And you've said to be a great performing artist, you have to be a great human being first. Yes. Please and thank you will always get fed in my house. And it may be old fashioned, but at the end of the day, you know, the last thing you want is, is for, you know, people to come back and, and because they'll only employ you because of word of mouth. And then word of mouth will get you in. And then it's your actions after that. You know, uh, you know uh, I remember uh, doing Star Wars and Samuel Jackson walked in on set for the first time and he had just finished shooting Shaft. And so he had this beautiful black leather jacket and this big, huge smile. And we just looked at him and he walked in and went, how is everyone? And we smiled. And then he walked right around and shook everyone's hand, introduced himself to everyone. And throughout the day, you would find him at the crafts table or, you know, making coffee, saying, no, no, I'll make a coffee and talking to anyone and everyone who was there taking photographs. And, and I thought, that's right, it doesn't take much to be nice to people, you know, because at the end of the day, it's not only a reflection of who you are, but it's a reflection of what you want them to be as well. The fact that we're talking about it doesn't take much to be nice to people makes me think that often in the entertainment industry, the opposite can be found really easily. Yeah, look, there are a lot of people that you come across that you can read really quickly. That it's about, it's the old, you know, actor's warm up. Me, 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 it's all about me, you know. That you realise that at the end of the day, you won't go far because you're burning bridges as we speak, you know. It's all about you, it's not about the rest of us, you know. I'm one of those people that will turn up with, you know, three dozen donuts and laugh at the vegans who go, oh, look, I can't, <laughs> and then half an hour later, <laughs> it's in there go, I'm not trying to trip you up. As a former vegan, yeah. I feel very seen by yeah. that comment. Yeah, and it is that thing of just going, you know, uh, where's the vegan stuff, you know? And I, and I always say, I've made an effort. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can make an effort yeah. too. And it's not, you know, for me, it's, it's part and parcel of my culture and who I am. But also it is part and parcel of what you're trying to instill in this community that you've now created in this show or this film that you're working on, that, you know, we are all... We're all together in this. That let's make this the most, you know, pleasant experience that we can get so that you come back and do another one. I want to take you back to the beginning of your career. Oh or, gosh. or your big break, rather. <laughs> That's right. Just before the fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> Water rats. Um, do you remember that time? What do you remember about playing that role? I remember getting cast in that role while I was still in New Zealand working on a show. And the initial thought I got was, I wonder how Australian actors act because, you know, obviously it was my first, one of my first big trips across. I didn't understand the undertaking that I was going across to do uh, because I didn't realise that I was the human doorstop. I was coming over here to wedge the door open to allow, you know, other Kiwis to come across. Well, and, and you were the first Polynesian person to be cast on an Australian TV series. Yes, and, you know, uh, on a mainstream drama. Yeah. I came across over, at, you know, 95. I had to make an effort and a decision that I was not going to be the comical relief, mm. that I was going to be an actor. So I shied away from any of the stuff that I would normally do, um, sing, play guitar, you know, make jokes and stuff. 
Um, and I was the straight legs actor, and it so happened that I got the th I was the third credit, you know, in in the titles, which I didn't really understand until a couple of years later when somebody explained to me this is the hierarchy that they have, you know, you know Colin Friels, Catherine McClements, and then you, and I went and but I said but there are other great actors, and I went, yeah, but this is how they work it, but I also knew that I had to do every junket, and when they realised that my character. You know, Constable Tommy Tavita was completely different from who I was. Um, you know, you started getting phone calls from all over the place. It sounds like there's this theme of, like, getting people to like you. Is that because there's an expectation that they might not? I was verbally sowing seeds. I had to not only introduce myself to you, knowing full well that I was, you know, I looked different from a lot of people. I wasn't First Nation, so I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, uh, um, you know, take that status. So uh, for me, it was very much, it was very much that thing of going, you know, I'm going to do a waka 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 to make you like me, and then I'm going to make you see who I really am. How does that? I mean, the entertainment industry, you're always putting yourself forward. You're, you know, you're dealing with rejection constantly as well. But then to add that extra layer, I guess, from what you're saying of your of your race, um, what does that struggle? do? How does that compound and intersect with, you know, just the life of an actor? Sometimes you have to, you have to truncate that and put it into one corner because if you thought about it, it would just make you angry. Mm. Um, I had experience when I came over here uh, looking for, I came over here before we started filming, looking for somewhere to stay. I was up in Potts Point looking at just the real estate stuff there. I was there with my wife. My wife is English. And I said, look, I'm just going to ask him about this place. I walked inside and said, um, there's a place out there. Um, it's a two-bedroom apartment. I was just wondering, you know, can you give me more details? And they went, ah, oh, that's already taken. Oh, OK, all right, not a problem, thank you. Walked out. And my wife saw another one. She goes, oh, I'm just going to ask them about this. And she walked back in. About 15 minutes later, she was still in there. And I went, what? And I, and I walked back in, same guy talking to her about these apartments. And I go, wait. What are you talking about? Uh, look, she went, look, this apartment here is available. And I looked at her and went, that was the same apartment I asked about. And I just looked at him in the eye and I just said, let's go. And we walked out. And I was just so devastated because it never occurred to me. It never happened to me in New Zealand. Mm. But when I came over here, it happened. And you realise really quickly, all right, there are some people that are like that, that will judge you on the colour of your skin or the fact that you're in drag, you know. That's life. Yeah. I either will carry that or I just let that, I jettison that out and just go. Continue. Well, you said, you know, you've got to put it aside, otherwise it'll make you angry. I mean, that feels like something worthy of being angry about, but I guess it's what you do with that anger and how you channel it. You can get angry and then you can fall into, well, you people are always like that. That's mm. the reason why. You know, you can you can be angry and and I suppose you can then answer the stereotype that they put on you. The, the problem is, is that it's all skewed against you anyway. And it's not, a, it's not a conspiracy theory. What you have to do is change their mind. And the only way you can change their mind is about being in the room, is getting in the room, is, is to change the action by, seeing, by allowing them to see what you bring to the table. And, you know, a lot of the time, they wouldn't even let you in the room, you know. And so when you're talking about... Uh, being able just to have roles that, you know, diverse performers can play, we're not asking for you to make, you know, an exemption. We're not asking you that, you know, you should put into law that, you know, 10% should be this. We're just asking you to, you know, to invite us in the room. We just want to be part of the conversation. The problem we're having, and we still have, is that we aren't even thought about until somebody goes, what about Jay? And I went, hey, what about Jay? You know, and all of a sudden it's just like, click, 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 tick all the boxes and then you come in and the job's done and then you, then you go away and then you have to wait for somebody else to have an epiphany. And I, as well as my other brethren, you know, everybody else has the same issues, you know. It's the thing of going, if it's difficult for a brown man to, you know, to get a job, how about being a brown woman to get a job or, you know, or, you know, or disabled? And so I think the thing is, is that we, as we go along in my, in my 40th year, it's one of those things that I have to, constantly be, you know, uh, out in front trying to make a change for my children. Mm.
have you seen that it's evolved and changed uh, in the Australian entertainment industry over time? I, I would like to say I have, but no, it hasn't. I mean, as much as you want to be able to say, yes, the industry is in great hands and, oh, look at Cinderella, she, you know, she's on at the moment and she's not white, she's a different... But that wasn't our idea. That came from over there, you know. We need ideas ourselves. We need ideas people and we need people to fund those ideas, you know, so that it becomes mainstream. And in doing so, it becomes accessible because if it's on TV, it must be real, you know. Whereas uh, for me, it's that it's the constant thing of going, I will keep banging this drum because the tune has not changed and the words have not changed. And as much as you go, but I've heard it, I've heard it so many times, yes, but nothing's happened. How does it change then? I think the thing is, is that you either shame people into going, look at this, and they go, oh, right, okay, um, well, I'll speak to somebody. I think it needs to change when you get people taking on the roles of producers of, of, you know, of the mouthpieces. They become the mouthpieces. This is what we're going to do. We want to do this and that. I mean, you know, people like Taika Waititi, who's a wonderful director, but also, you know, his movies are so diverse because, you know, he casts locally. He casts friends, but he also casts because you're good at what you do and you will bring texture to the screen. And for here, for me, it's that, that conversation of going, we want representation. The running joke that All Saints, which was a wonderful drama, locally made drama, that ran for 10 years, they had no Indian or uh, Chinese doctors, you know, in the, you know, even as extras, mm. which I thought was just hilarious. Because if you go into any ER here in, in, in Sydney alone, you know, there's a plethora of, of people from all over the world, you know, coming to your aid. And I think it, it is... It is sad, you know, what the country lacks is imaginative writers mm -hmm. because I think my argument always is that I'm an actor who happens to be Samoan. Don't write a Samoan actor because then you will run out of things to write about. If you write, I'm a doctor who happens to be Samoan, then you can write about the doctor who happens to have an ethnic background and then we can deal with that. When you're walking on Moonbeam to see. You're performing in the Darlinghurst Theatre Company production of the musical Once. Yes. Um, give me a little bit of a setup about that, your character and the plot. Well, uh, I play uh, Da, who's the father of one of our main characters, uh, Toby Francis. It's a story about a boy and a girl who meet on a Dublin street. He's a busker that's just disillusioned with his music and he's giving it in. The girl who's Czech happens to meet him and hear his music and thinks it's lovely. And then it's their interaction over maybe five or six days of her supporting him and saying, you should go after your dream. Uh, the lovely thing about Once is, is that not only do we have wonderful performers, um, but we also, uh, the 12 of us, we all play the instruments in the show because it's a musical. So at any one point, you'll have two actors who are acting and in the background, you'll have other actors who are playing Violins, saws, cello. I mean, what are you playing? I play five different instruments. I play guitar, ukulele, um, harmonica, piano and drums. One of the biggest reasons why I said I would do once was because it gave me the opportunity to show my craft but also to be able to go, um, once again, if you're watching me, you can do this as well. I play guitar or I play violin because I always say afterwards, speaking with the you know people in the in the uh, in the bar or whatever, I go, do you have kids that you know are learning to play? And they went, oh, my child's learning to play violin. I went, this is the end result. Okay, just hang in there. <laughs> hang another in, ten, hang on another to that. ten years. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> another ten years. Um, once is using this technique of colorblind casting. Can you explain that to me? Um, the, we have uh, Indian characters, Korean characters, Filipinos uh, playing Czech and Irish people in it. When I was cast as the father, I had I was the one that had the problem. I, you know, I was looking around going, you, you, you do know, a bit like you when you were reading for play school, you yeah. do know that, yeah. and Toby is, and they said, yeah, that, no, that's not the issue, that's not a problem. And I was the one that had to get over it which I found really interesting because I, I felt guilty because I thought surely there's a white Irish guy out there going, I could have done that role a lot better than he did, <laughs> you know. But they said, no, we cast you because we, we know what you bring to the table. 
we also know uh, that you will be fantastic in this role of the father. And I realised, uh, you know, and I was good with that. Not only the fact that, you know, my wife is English and my children are all half cast as well. Um, but, yeah, look, it, it, you know, it's the independents that stand up and, and make this decision to cast a diverse cast. And I think the people with the money, they need to put their money, mouth, you know, money where their mouth is and go, we should follow suit. Mm. Do you think that colourblind casting could be the answer to Australia's diversity issues? I think colourblind casting has always been the answer, you know, because the audience will watch it and for some reason there's this idea that the audience will go, no, 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 go back and refilm that because it should have been a white person or it should have been this. No, they'll film it and if, if the character works, they'll go, that was wonderful, that, you know, that show was great. It's particularly fascinating when it comes to uh, completely fictitious scenarios like The Little Mermaid, when people get up in arms about, you can't have a black little mermaid. And you're like, well, first of all, mermaids don't exist that we know of. And second of all, who says that they're not black? I think the greatest example of that is Jesus. Because mm. when people go, you know, look at Jesus here, it's beautiful. And you go, well, you do know Jesus wasn't white and blue-eyed, right? And they go, how dare you? Are you against Jesus? I went, no. But if Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it's not, it's not Bethlehem, you know, country Victoria, you know. It's somewhere else. And, and all of a sudden they go, you know, anyway, um, you know. <laughs> you are a father of eight children. Um, uh, apart from all of these roles and this career spanning 40 years, you've also been raising eight humans. I just can't fathom that. What is that like? Well, so, well someone when I once asked, you know, how do you go about raising eight kids? And I go, well, you stay on tour, basically. <laughs> Send them chocolates and I pictures. I don't believe that. Yeah. Look, I think for me, I was always a father first and a performer second. I love being a father. I'm not always as good at it as I should be. Um, but I suppose that's why I have my wife there. You know, she balances off. She's a maths and English teacher. So, you know, when you're not good at that side, you just marry that side of the brain. Um, but I don't know. I think they've made me um, a better performer because they've forced me to take roles that, I, you know, normal, you know, other people go, oh, no, I don't. I don't do commercials, you know. I'm too, I'm too good for that. You know, I've got, yeah, yeah, okay, all right, when do you want me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I can stay longer. For eight mouths to Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and in doing so, I suppose... I've always had the question, why don't you go to America? Why don't you do this and do that? And it's, well, A, my responsibility is here. And also, I, I can do everything I want to do in America here because they're watching us. You know, I've worked on Star Wars. I've worked with Samuel Jackson and Willem Dafoe. I've been really blessed with my career. And this year, I made a determined effort that I'm going back to theatre. I'm going to go back to working my craft because I got a bit worried that I was taking one-off jobs or three, you know, these three-day jobs just to pay the bills. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to go back and I'm going to work my craft this year. I'm going to make people see me do my craft so that it's not a surprise to them, but most importantly, so that I can just tick that box off in my own head going, yeah, I'm, I'm still good at this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm OK with this, yeah. <laughs> and you've got kids that have uh, entered the performing arts. Yes, boo-hoo. How do you feel about stuff? I want them to get a proper job. That's what I want them to do, <laughs> for goodness sake. Um, look, I think my son is working on Hamilton at the moment. I, I suppose it was when I saw him, because he covers a lot of the other principal roles, and he covered Burr one night. And I went along especially to see him. And it was only after that performance that I realised, and my parents never told me, I realised that I can now look away from you you are okay. Mm. I can now concentrate on these, you know, people over here because um, you are good to go. And it was a, an epiphany for me. And I, I, I admit I cried a little bit, gave him a big hug, but I realised that he was in good hands now. Well, it has been a wonderful 40 years watching you on our television screens and our movie screens. And thank you, Jay Gaia, so much for joining me today on One Plus One. May the force be with you. <laughs>